Welcome to episode 27 of The Brainstorm. Today we're talking gene editing and Gemini, and we're joined by Ali Ehrman to talk about the first ever approval of a gene editing uh, cure. Is it a cure, Ali? What happened? We hope so. It's potentially a cure. Um, so last Friday, the FDA, which you know is our governing body for, for food, for drugs, um, et cetera, basically announced that the first ever gene editing approval was uh, given to CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex Pharmaceuticals for a uh, medicine called Kashjevi. Um, you may have heard us talking about Exocel in the past, so this is their, their new name. Uh, this therapy is to treat people with sickle cell disease. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, sickle cell disease is a rare disease. It essentially inhibits your red blood cells. Um, they get like a sickle shape, which would look like a half moon shape. And as you can imagine, um, it's pretty difficult for those half moon shapes to travel around your body to deliver oxygen. And that's the problem that happens when people have sickle cell disease. Um, it's a terrible disease. Uh, people who typically have sickle cell disease need to go in and out of the hospital many, many times to get blood transfusions. So CRISPR and Vertex came up with a therapy that targets uh, the BCL11A gene, um, the BCL11A gene, and uh, and this essentially, um, typically uh, after birth, your fetal hemoglobin will shut off, your adult hemoglobin turns on. But if there's a problem with the adult hemoglobin, uh, you can go back and target that fetal hemoglobin to turn back on. Um, and then it's a disease that impacts about 100,000 people in the U.S. and 20 million people worldwide. So we think this is uh, pretty incredible and maybe worth it also to mention that Legenia, a bluebird gene therapy, uh, was approved as well. Um, and the difference between the two is that um, Kishjevi, which is a gene edit, um, actually alters the gene. Uh, gene editing can do a lot of things. It can modify, it can insert, uh, it can take away a gene, uh, whereas typically for a gene therapy, they will add an extra copy of a gene, which is exactly what Bluebird does. Um, and just the difference between the two in terms of number of centers ready to go, uh, Kashjevi has nine, Legenia has 27. They target different genes, like I mentioned, Kashjevi, BC11A, uh, Legenia, beta globin. Um, also price, which is pretty important, something uh, a lot of people are gonna focus on, Kashjevi, 2.2 million, which is the CRISPR and Vertex drug. The Bluebird drug is 3.1 million. Um, patient population at 12 and older for CRISPR and 12 to 50 uh, for Bluebird. And one really important nuance, I think, also is that uh, Bluebird got a, a black box label, um, which essentially means that there's a warning on it that says that you can get a secondary malignancy or a secondary cancer, uh, which did happen uh, in the Bluebird trial and CRISPR did not get that. So, so um, yeah. Yeah, Ali, a lot to dig in there. And I know Sam wants to get to price and, and a few of the other points you made, but I wanna start with how is the therapy administered to the patient? Um, yeah, yeah that, I'm very interested to hear that. Yeah, so it sounds uh, it sounds like how do you edit a gene? Um, so the process is simple for the patient in essence, uh, just in the sense that the editing happens outside of the body. So mm -hmm. what happens is um, your cells are collected. Essentially, what typically happens is that a sickle cell disease patient would typically get a bone marrow transplant. And so if you're doing that, you would typically need to find someone who's a perfect match, uh, which could be like a sibling. Uh, maybe a parent, someone very close family, and that just isn't always available. And so what then happens is that um, if you don't have um, a family member that can do it or go through the process, or, you know, if you're just not able to do it in that way, this is another option. Um, and basically what it means is you're your own donor. So they take your cells, they edit them in the lab, they gene edit them, whether it's, you know, the different strategies between the gene edit or the gene therapy, um, I should mention that typically patients for sickle cell disease are on hydroxyurea, which is a symptom management medication. And so if you are on that, you do need to let that sort of get out of your system. And so that takes some time. The other thing that these patients typically do before is fertility preservation, uh, because this can affect fertility. 
um, more the chemotherapy than the actual uh, a drug administration. But uh, a lot of people will undergo fertility preservation. So that can definitely take some time. Uh, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, they'll extract the cells, um, your stem cells, they'll be sent to the lab. They'll do either process, the, the Bluebird process or the CRISPR process. Um, the patient would then get chemotherapy to allow room for those new cells to come in um, and new space. And then those new cells are, are going to be reintroduced into the body. Wow. And so what is the typical cost for, right, you mentioned 2.2 million. How much did this cost to treat before this? Is this like a amazing way to cut the burden on the healthcare system? Or is it a new technology coming in at a higher price point? Yeah, currently, we think that um, medical costs for an average sickle cell patient over a patient's, you know, let's say 50 year life are about $2 million. Um, and so if you think about it, there are about 100,000 patients that have sickle cell disease in the US, there are 20 million patients worldwide. So you can imagine that there's probably, you know, 100 plus billion spent for, you know, to, uh, bringing forth this potential cure to patients. But even so, that would be worth it um, because of the burden that the healthcare system would have. And then this was the first. The first. Is this opening a floodgate or is it going to be a trickle as other ones get approved? Like, was there some acceptance and saying, okay, we know there's not, you know, off target effects with this type of editing, or is it still going to be somewhat of a slog for other editing cures to come through? Yeah, well, the clinical trial process takes a really long time. So typically it takes, you know, about 10 years and, and one to two billion. So um, they're all going through the process. Um, sickle cell leads really well for a double strand uh, DNA break. And so that's why this is a really good indication to start with. Um, but uh, you can check out our big ideas deck. Uh, from last year, which shows sort of the proliferation of these trials for gene editing. Um, and we think they're going to continue to proliferate. But just just the only question is the time it takes to go through clinical trials. And, you know, we think AI is going to improve that timeline, but um, it still takes quite a bit of time. So uh, just waiting for those clinical trials to read out, to show data. And so they're all coming down the pipeline, but I imagine it to be more of a trickle. Um, and then really excited to see sort of the bigger indications um, that are sort of, you know, like diabetes that affects just such a large amount of people and obviously cardiovascular. So there are a couple of companies like Verve um, and then also CRISPR Therapeutics, Vertex and others uh, working on diabetes and cardiovascular. So I think those will be really excited when they come uh, to fruition. And, and those are coming, you know, maybe by 2030. And it was approved. So if you have the disease, can you go get treated now? Or is there another step from approval to being able to actually buy the cure? Yeah, I mean, the centers are going to be opening now. So um, I would say it's probably going to be open within, you know, a couple months or probably 2024. Um, but yeah, it's it's ready to ready to be administered. That's great. great. Ali, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Uh, last quick question. Um, Magic School Bus or Osmosis Jones? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, are those the only two options? I mean, you can you can offer a third. Um, no, I'll go with Magic School Bus. There you have it. All right. <laughs> thanks, Ali. Thanks. All right, Nick, last week we were talking a lot about large language models and prompt engineering. This past week, Gemini seemed like they were doing a little prompt engineering of their own. What what did they do? Why were people mad? And what is there to be excited about? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, big shout out to the web team, Frank Downing specifically. He broke uh, this news down for us on Friday during the brainstorm. And so I'll do my best job to try to delineate all of, uh, uh, of the news and, and the way that we're approaching this 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 problem. Um, what's interesting is, so Google has uh, announced a new large language model, Gemini. This is really the latest in a suite of foundation models it has. Um, but the first that is uh, purportedly 
to be trained specifically for multimodal. So this includes images, audio, video, and text. Um, so this is from the ground up a multimodal uh, model, which I think in and of itself is you know quite fascinating and interesting. I think this might be the first of its kind um, to have these capabilities. And if you think about Google's suite of other products, um, it, you know there's probably a reason they're able to do this. They have YouTube, um, they have you know several products where they have training data to allow for you know, such a model to exist. Um, but what's interesting here, and hopefully we'll be able to get the graphic up, is um, Google started to benchmark its model against um, some of the other models out there, specifically GPT-4. It wanted to show that you know, it could perform as well as GPT-4. Um, and one of those benchmarking tasks is an exam called the Massive Multitask Language Understanding Benchmark. Um, it's a multiple choice question, which is across 57 different subjects. Um, and on Google's Gemini Ultra model, it scored a 90% versus ChatGBT4, which scored 87. Um, and you know some interesting differences here um, is one, how it's being prompted. Um, so you have chain of thought uh, versus five shot. And in, in the chain of thought, um, example, it actually scored higher, but with five shot, it don't, it actually scored lower. So this is, again, I think Sam, you were referencing, right? Google is, you know, picking and choosing some stats to show here. And not only did they do this on the benchmarking exam, but they also did this in an, a, a later video that they released, which, um, maybe we'll get some clips up as well. Um, but in this video, I think everyone that saw it, it you know, went online, people were raving about definitely, it on Twitter. Definitely went a little viral. A, Everyone's like, oh my little, goodness. Right, a little viral. And, um, you know, what we at, you know, first glance thought was, you know, a very capable model. We soon, you know, realized there was, you know, maybe something going on behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, a few people then reported that, you know, the prompts that we were hearing in the video weren't actually the real prompts being um, asked of the model. So there are some performance differences between, you know, how the model was actually being um, tasked or prompted versus what we saw in the video. And I think that is really and I think, you know, Frank summarizes it perfectly in the title of his Sunday newsletter, which is it's an unforced error, right? So you obviously have some clear differences between how this uh, model is being marketed and how it actually performs. And I think, you know, what we realized in the Friday brainstorm is you don't really need to do that, right? You have DeepMind. Google is, you know, very highly valued in, in the world of AI um, and respected. And there's really no need to, you know, go out there and showcase something that doesn't actually exist. Um, I think the way that the model performs without all of this, you know, fancy dressing uh, is still remarkable that they're able to, you know, release this. And I think, you know, every week we're on this show talking about new advancements in AI. And this is just another step in, in the direction of, you know, AI seemingly consuming everything <laughs> and, and everything that we do. Right. And I think from my side, the two takeaways, one, the vector of improvement is interesting, right? Training from the ground up to be multimodal. Like this is an avenue that has been, you know, less explored than the prompt engineering side. And then the other side of it is exactly what you're just saying there is the marketing versus AI and, you know, company culture matters and they have the talent, but it seems as though it is difficult for these large companies, um, to get out of their own way a little bit, you know, that's classic innovators dilemma. So to me, you know, it's very exciting and hopefully, you know, Google can come out and continue to build in a less flashy way and more substance because there's clearly some substance there that we should be tracking. Yeah. And I want to maybe spend some time here just talking about multimodal because I do think that is the future. You know, we've talked about and had some topics on this show around multimodal, but I think when you start to see advancements of this kind and companies approach it from the ground up, as you know, Google is now doing with Gemini, that really starts to excite me from at least the digital consumer angle, because you know, this is, I think, what leads the way and, and paves the way to truly smart assistants um, living with us. And you know, that's what we're interacting with. 
um, but you need it to be multimodal. And so I think it is, you know, fascinating to see Google. And again, I think it's because they have unique training data with YouTube and, and some of the other assets it has that they're able to do this. Um, but, you know, I think we'll, we'll see what, you know, continues uh, to, to happen here. I'm sure OpenAI is going to come out with something, you know, it's just, we're in an arms race right now. And so, you know, next week, I'm sure we'll be talking about the, you know, the, the latest foundation model. Right. Mistral, X Mist I mean, this is, this is Monday. Right. There's other yeah, news this is coming out. Right. Yeah. Um, but it does, you know, the constant question that we are asking is, is there any moat or is this a race to the bottom right. and, um, you know, they'll, they'll be freely available and they'll have some different capabilities, but they won't be able to accrue value to that layer. Yeah. I think that's the big question, right? Where does the value accrue in this, in this stack? Is it at the foundation level? Is it at the platform level? Is it at the application level? Uh, beyond that, is it at you know maybe the hardware level? Are you know, uh, it's 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 a, a question that I don't think we're we're ready to answer, but we're constantly toying with. I think we have ideas about where value is starting to accrue, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you know the 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 value will be at, in ten years. Um, it's so new, it's it's moving at such a fast pace. I don't think we've ever seen a technology move this fast and be, I think, as transparent as it has been as well. And that's the other, um, I think, competition, which is open source versus closed. Um, and, you know, how fast uh, these models are improving on a performance level between open source and closed. And, you know, that's another race happening parallel to everything else. Well, that's maybe gets to this. I'll, I'll just ask you this last question update on your model usage you know are you a chat gpt grok anthropic where where is most of your time being spent i am right now spending most of my time in chat gpt i just got access to grok I, I believe you also did uh i think it's you know interesting i don't um i i i just have the chat gpt app on my phone so it's just a lot easier and I've, I've just been used to prompting that versus Gronk I think you have to be a bit more specific because of the the uh, I guess the angle that they took with it right you know it's a bit snarky um, to say the least so you kind of have to work around that if you want a, a, did a it, more serious did it give answer. you a good roast it did it did roast me maybe that's why I, I may just you know be holding a grudge against it because it was it was quite mean <laughs> to me no that's I just I've been used to chat GBT, So that's what I've been using. And I, I'd agree. I think most of my, I did just get access to Grok, as you said, so testing it out, but largely using chat GPT for editing purposes. Um, and Dolly, Dolly's great. Uh, I mean, I know Meta came out with their recent tool, but for me, still, still using Dolly a fair well, amount. Well, yeah, I, I wrote Dolly into my chat GPT use yeah. because I can, you know, ask chat GPT to prompt Dolly. Um, and I, I was actually playing around with Gronk this morning, and it was interesting to get summaries of events happening on Twitter. I think it's actually quite good at. And if you think of Twitter as a real-time news engine, I think there is you know a real use case for that type of prompting and, and that type of summarization. Um, you know, it's pulling off of live tweets, and so its ability to uh, fill me in on something that I may have missed. Um, I thought it was actually quite good at, and it didn't, you know, have as much of a snarky tone to it. It was, you know, very just kind of upfront about, you know, here's what happened. So on, I thought that was that, fun. Yeah, yeah. On that front, right? There's definitely this angle of data being important. These foundation models training on things that are widely available, X with a unique data set here. Um, it seems to me, and we were discussing it somewhat in brainstorm, Grok should be able to lead to better ad targeting, should it not? I think it's possible. Um, I think w we have yet to really see how AI will change the ad landscape. I think, you know, it's definitely looking like within search itself, you know, AI is starting to replace how people search and the way that they search. And so trying to fill in advertising to this kind of new search, search methodology is definitely something I think all 
companies will start to explore, especially, you know, the Googles, the Twitters, companies that are already exposed to advertising. Um, in terms of, you know, how it will actually change the ad model itself, I'm not sure if they're, you know, working to incorporate that at this stage. You know, there's um, different ways that you can do that for, you know, that they may be exploring, but I haven't seen anything online about them, you know, starting to incorporate it in how advertisers use the platform and how mm -hmm. uh, advertising is then delivered to users. But I, I think, right. yeah, it's definitely something that should improve. Or even onboarding, right? Joining X is a difficult endeavor, right? You got to choose how to make the platform useful. If Grok can serve you up, you know, the interesting people to follow who are in the weeds, you know, with just a simple question, then, then that could be interesting as well. Yeah, definitely. I think there's plenty of use cases. It makes total sense why they're rolling this out to users. Great. There you have it. We'll see you next week for episode 28. 28. Feeling Thanks, great. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>